So, are we good? Oh, yeah, just swap that out. I'll talk. All right, ladies and gentlemen, just a couple of announcements before we get started. A couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, we've still got t-shirts. Come and get them. $15 cash donation to the EFF or the Hackers for Charity gets you a t-shirt of choice. Uh, we still have most of the sizes left. We have ladies and youth sizes. So if you haven't got something for your significant other or you're stalking someone and want them to look uh, cool, you can pick one of those up. Uh, we also have bags. Um, uh, we have bags from this year and last year. Anyone that puts on a con, you'll find that you have a lot of swag left over at the end. So uh, uh, they go through uh, the next year and uh, sell what they've had left over from previous years. Uh, the money uh, that uh, is raised from selling the last year's bags and last year's t-shirts goes to the Hackers for Charity and the EFF. Uh, so it's a good cause. I don't know why I get to uh, make this announcement, but Python for Newbies is going on from 11 to 1 in the Com uh, Columbia foyer, the chill out area right over here. Um, not that I think Tyler wants you to get up and walk out of his talk right now, but uh, just to let everybody know, if you have any feedback, uh, you can email it to feedback at shmoocon.org or go to the website at feedback.shmoocon.org or you can email it additionally to info at shmoocon.org or heidi at shmoo.com or you can just stand and scream. If you got any uh, feedback, good, bad, or indifferent, doesn't matter, just let them know. Uh, they uh, always are looking for ways to improve and uh, anything that may have gone wrong that they need to know about would be awesome. Or if you just want to say thank you, they appreciate that. Uh, stop by and visit the Hackers for Charity booth. Um, they had all their stuff that was uh, being flown in from Uganda got lost yesterday. Uh, I think uh, Johnny tweeted on Friday that it actually had never left the tarmac. So they've got it in. They've got some really cool leather work stuff uh, and things that were handmade that they're, uh, they're selling to uh, raise money for their charity. And as always, as I guess Ted's not here. I don't see a flamboyant dressed man in a red hat. Uh, Ted has DVDs of all of the talks from ShmooCon and actually a lot of other hacker conferences uh, towards the uh, registration area. He's got a booth set up, and uh, within an hour or so of uh, the conclusion of Tyler's talk, you can actually go get a copy of it. Um, so if you get a chance to do that, uh, check out Ted. And uh, when you see him, shake his hand. Uh, we want to give good thanks to Ted for all the work he's done. He drives out and uh, records all the, uh, the talks for him and takes good care of him. So we want to say thank you to him. So. Um, we got some uh, product toss. You got any good trivia questions? Um, does anybody know how many bytes, or within how many bytes, a PDF header needs to be in within a PDF document? More than one. It's more than a little more specific than that. Uh, I think it's a little bit more than that. Yep. <laughs> That's all I have. Who was closest? Uh, we got a large shirt here. Who's up for a large shirt? Anyone wear a large shirt? Here. There you go, sir. Oh. <laughs> I got sued over that one. I've got another large shirt in white. Very unpopular, but it works. There we go. Scott Alcon bag. Anyone need a bag? You know, you raised your hand first. Let's walk. Come on. Let's go. Watch now. Appreciate it, sir. And I had one trivia question. Who's seen? I had a trivia question, right? 42. Do what? 42. Yes, yes, yes. I've seen that too. Okay, so um, <laughs> you're, not, you're not original with that. I'm sorry. Um, so we've got the mooses. These are very hard to come by. They don't just fall out of trees or come out of the ground. So um, who's been to DEF CON? All right, cool. Uh, why was DEF CON 1 held in Las Vegas? War games. Jesus. War games, why? Three, three locations in uh, uh, the movie War Games, Seattle, New York, and Las Vegas were the, the primary targets in it. So Jeff Moss actually picked Las Vegas for that. So boys and girls, Tyler, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Have at it. Somebody going to give me time prompts? Do you want? Yes, they'll be back in the back. All right. <coughs> 
Well, I want to thank everybody for coming to the last session before the uh, uh, closing plenary. Um, my name is Tyler Hudak. Uh, I'm here to talk about Massif, a new open source uh, automated static analysis framework that we released. We actually just released it yesterday, um, so it's available to go out. Um, here's my contact information. Uh, I've been in the information security industry for over 10 years. Um, I'm a senior security analyst for CoreLogic Security. I'm also the lead malware analyst and reverse engineer, which isn't saying much because I'm the only malware analyst and reverse engineer. Um, but uh, I also teach some malware analysis courses, and I'm just a big old nerd that loves what he does. I get to play with malware all the time. It's what I love doing, and so I'm able to uh, do that as my job. Kind of lucky. So um, as I, I talk about uh, Mastiff, um, I'm a malware guy, so I'm going to focus on malware analysis, the malware anal analysis aspect of it. Um, but you'll see that there are other uh, things that you can do with it. It doesn't just apply to malware analysis. It applies to incident response. It applies to just generalized file analysis. Um, but like I said, I'm going to focus everything on the malware analysis side because I'm a malware guy. Right. So the malware analysis process typically goes like this. Um, you obtain the malware, whether that's from the help desk, uh, during an incident response uh, engagement, um, forensics, you know, your mom calls you telling you that she has a problem on her computer, somehow you get malware that you need to analyze. Then you typically go through, you take that malware and you go through a two-stage process where you do static analysis, which is looking at the characteristics of the malware without executing it, and then dynamic analysis, which is uh, looking at the uh, behavior of the malware by executing it within a VM or a sandbox or, or something along those lines. Once you go through all that, you uh, do reporting. Um, so like I said, static analysis is analyzing the malware character characteristics or the characteristics of the file without actually doing um, any execution. Uh, we'll, we'll be looking, when you do this, you look at the hashes that are generated, the cryptographic hashes from the file, see what the, that information can give you. If it's a Windows executable, you're looking at the uh, PE header to figure out, you know, uh, maybe what files it imports, uh, when it was compiled, uh, and so on. Um, you can find a lot of information from static analysis. You can find out who create, potentially who created it, when it was created, um, what it does based off of the strings and the imports that you're seeing within the, uh, the document or the, um, sorry, the file. Um, are there any exploits within it? If you're looking at malicious documents, you want to know, you know, does this, ex does this uh, exploit some uh, vulnerability? Is it a new vulnerability? And so on. Um, and there are a variety of techniques here. And uh, on the side here, I just kind of listed out some of the techniques that you, you'd be doing. Um, typically, first, you do file type identification. You want to figure out what type of file you're dealing with uh, to begin with. Um, just because it has an .exe extension doesn't mean it's an executable. Just because it has a JPJ, uh, uh, JPG um, extension doesn't mean it's a JPEG. It could be some other type of file, or there could be an additional file embedded within it somewhere. Then you look at crypto, you look at hashes, whether that's cryptographic hashes or fuzzy hashes, and you know what information that can give you. If it's a Windows executable, you look at the header, you look at the imports, you look at uh, the compile time, and so on. Uh, you look at the embedded strings. And if the malware is packed, typically you go through a process to unpack it somehow, and then you start all over again uh, at the beginning of the static analysis process. Um, so there are lots of different techniques available, and since we're uh, computer people, we like to automate things, we like to make things go faster. We we tend to try to automate malware analysis. Um, automating malware analysis is great. There are a lot of great projects out there uh, that talk about it. Uh, the nice thing about it is it makes your analysis process go much faster and you're less prone to mistakes. Um, if you're going through the uh, process manually and you're typing the commands uh, at the command line, if you're running GUI tools uh, by hand, chances are at some point you're gonna mess up. And when you mess up, that means you either need to start over whether at the beginning of the process, depending on what phase you're in, or you know, your data is corrupt and you need to start that over again. So just automating it uh, makes it much easier uh, to do. Um, and there are a lot of great frameworks to do this. Uh, the Cuckoo Sandbox from the HoneyNet project is a great uh, download and do it uh, your own. There are a lot of great online sandboxes like Threat Expert and Anub Anubis, which automate this process for you. Uh, Richard Harmon yesterday gave a great talk on how to uh, automate your own malware analysis process. Um, but most frameworks that automate malware analysis, they focus on the, the dynamic analysis part, the looking at the behavior of the malware, and really for good reason. Um, this is the part of the analysis process which tends to be the hardest. You want to automate the most so you can get your information out quickly, um, and it's going to give you the most information that you want to see. Um, it's going to tell you how the malware interacts with the system, what files it drops, who it contacts on the network, and so on. Um, the problem, though, is that Static analysis still gives you a lot of great information. Um, and the frameworks out there that automate malware analysis, 
they don't really um, do much with uh, automating the static analysis process. Um, in, in looking through it, uh, when I started looking at all these different frameworks, um, they do give you some static analysis information. They'll generate the hashes, they'll generate a fuzzy hash, they'll pull out embedded strings. If it's a document like a PDF, they'll run uh, DDA Stevens tools against it and give you that output, but that's pretty much it. Um, there's no, there was no uh, framework out there which fully automated the static analysis process for you and allowed you to expand it to use uh, whatever new tools or techniques uh, you wanted to, um, to use. Uh, in addition to that, if uh, you're analyzing a specific file type, um, that they didn't have static analysis tools for, then you weren't going to get any static analysis information out of that. So again, being computer people, what we like to do is figure out our own solution to this. And so what most analysts would do is go through and create some master script that would automate the ma uh, malware, um, the static analysis for us. Um, this is just a sample of one. This is actually one that I used in, uh, in a former job where I just created this quick bash script. I have um, the tools that I, I want to run, I give it a file and a directory to dump the output, and it just goes through and it runs sequentially all these different tools against the file. This is a great way to do static analysis. It happens very fast. Um, it runs the tools that I want. Um, but there are problems with this technique. Um, the primary problem is not all the techniques or not all the uh, files that we run against it will work on every file type. Um, so some static analysis techniques that um, that we use are universal. They can be run on any file type. So embedded strings analysis, pulling out the embedded strings within a file. You can run that pretty much on any file and you're going to get some information out. Hashing, whether it's cryptographic or um, uh, fuzzy hashing, that's going to give you some type of information out. But other techniques are not universal. They only work on specific file types. So for example, PE header analysis, pulling out imports uh, and resources and things like that from a Windows executable isn't going to work on a PDF. If you run one of the uh, PE header analysis tools on a PDF, you're probably going to crash the tool. Um, PDF document analysis isn't going to work on a Microsoft document. Um, you run PDF ID or PDF parser against a Microsoft document, it's either going to crash or give you some weird data out. Um, this, the screenshot I have up here is just an example. I ran PDF parser against a Windows executable. And it ran OK, um, which is a, a great uh, thing, um, considering that it was using a format that it really shouldn't have been able to uh, parse. Um, but everything that came out were just, it just kept saying that there were PDF comments throughout the uh, Windows executable. Um, this is the best case scenario, that it's just going to give you weird data. Um, the worst case scenario is that um, it's going to crash your tool. And in the automation process, you never want your tools to crash. Because once they crash, that means you have to start all over again. So the, so the obvious solution to this is, you know, we want to use some type of tools to perform file type detection. Um, by using some type of tool to figure out what type of file we're dealing with, then we can maybe put some branches in our master script so that if it's a PDF, then just run these tools. If it's a Windows executable, just run these other tools. Um, the most common way that I've uh, seen this done, uh, in my experience, is using the Unix file command, or, or libmagic. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's basically a, a database that contains a, um, uh, a list of signatures for the footers, or for the headers and footers of some file formats. You run file against it, and it will um, tell you what type of file it is. Um, unfortunately, uh, again, in my experience, the file command or libmagic doesn't always find everything correctly. There are times where it uh, thinks a file, oops, sorry. There, there are times where it thinks that one file is another format or it doesn't identify the file type correctly. Um, you especially run into these situations when a single file type can be used for multiple formats. Um, so in other words, uh, zip files. Um, zip files, the zip file format are obviously used for compression and archiving of other files. However, they're also used for a number of other formats like Java jars, APKs, the new Office X, uh, DocX, whatever you have formats. Those all have a base zip file. So if you run file against one of those additional files, what, what is it going to give you back? Is it going to tell you it's a zip file? Is it going to tell you that it's a jar? Is it going to tell you it's an APK? Um, so there's so libmagic isn't the uh, be-all, end-all in, in doing this. It's gonna, you're going to come across uh, mistakes. Um, there are other situations where uh, files can be contained within other files. So let's say you have a flash document in a, uh, or a flash file within a Word document, which is often used for exploits. Um, you want to know that, that during static analysis that that flash document is in there, or that flash file is in, embedded within the document. File libmagic isn't going to tell you that. Uh, it doesn't 
drill down into that to, to find that stuff. You still want to be able to see that. Um, and then files that are multiple types. Um, what I mean by this is, uh, a great example is uh, Quarkamix. Um, if you're familiar with the, uh, I think I pronounced it correctly, the, the Korkami uh, project, which is a, a great project um, that has a lot of uh, good resource information for reverse engineering, they came out with a file called Quarkamix, which is a single file, which is a valid PDF, Windows executable, Java jar, Python script, and HTML with functioning JavaScript within it. All these, <coughs> excuse me, all these formats are within uh, this particular file. Um, the reason this, this can be done is that the different specifications for different file types or file formats um, don't necessarily specify that the, the header for that file needs to start at byte zero. So, uh, like I said in the beginning of the trivia, the PDF spec um, says that the header for the PDF file, which is percent PDF dash and then some version number, has to be within the first uh, 1K bytes of the file. It doesn't have to be at byte zero. Um, and Corkamix takes advantage of this. And we'll actually look at it in a couple slides. <coughs> um, there are some other problems as well with automating static analysis. Um, if you're trying to automate static analysis uh, and you don't know about a static analysis technique that's out there or a tool that's out there, you're obviously not going to be automating it. So you're going to be missing at some uh, techniques or tools uh, that are out there which could be very which could be providing very useful data to you. And finally, you know, in my experience as an incident responder, you typically don't have time to go out and code your own new analysis techniques. You're typically always under the fire or always under the gun to go out and, you know, you have your next incident right after the other. You don't have time to go out and test code and uh, implement your own techniques. So because of all these problems, uh, we decided to create Mastiff. Uh, Mastiff is a framework which automates the entire static analysis process for you. Um, it really does two things. Uh, first is it's going to automatically determine the file type for you, um, and then it's going to only apply the techniques for, that fi for those file types that it, de that it detected against uh, that particular file for you. Um, this is an open source project. That it's uh, hosted on SourceForge. Again, we pushed it out last night, or I'm sorry, yesterday afternoon. Um, it's written in Python, and uh, it's we, re we wrote it so that it's very extensible uh, using uh, plugins. And we'll get into all this uh, as I go through. <clears throat> One thing before I go any farther is I want to say that we were able to write this um, because of the DARPA Cyber Fast Track uh, program. Um, just out of curiosity, has anybody either you been part of the, the CFT or know about it? All right, so about half of you. So if you don't know, um, CFT is basically a program that was created by Mudge uh, at DARPA which allows, um, I'll just read here, it allows uh, boutique security companies, individuals, and hacker maker spaces to overcome hurdles such as time and money to realize their research ideas without changing their cultures. In other words, it's a program to let you uh, do the research you want to get paid and get paid for it so that you can do it on work time and that you can produce the things that you want. Um, there have been a lot of projects that have come out of this um, that are really good. Um, and in fact, some of them have even been presented here at ShmooCon. Um, proposals are still being accepted through uh, April 1st, 2013. Um, you end up owning all the intellectual property uh, at the end of it, so it's not like you're giving it to DARPA. Um, they're pretty much paying you to do it. Um, there's the, uh, the URL for it. Uh, Mudge did a Reddit AMA a couple days ago uh, where he talked uh, a lot about it, so I highly recommend going out and checking it out. So, but getting back to Mastiff. Um, we, when I created Mastiff, we wanted to make it so that it was expandable. That, uh, because having it be more expandable means that it's going to be more useful to people and that we can add more and more capabilities into it. And the way you do that is through plugins. Um, so Mastiff uses uh, plugins for two different types of, uh, or two different functionality, functions within uh, the framework. Uh, first is for file type detection and then for static analysis, for actually performing the static analysis techniques. Um, we call these category plugins. These are the ones that uh, detect the file types, and then analysis plugins, which um, perform the actual analysis. Uh, we implemented this using uh, Yapsy, which is uh, an open source uh, Python uh, plugin library. Um, but the way that Massive works in general is, first you give a file to uh, the framework. Uh, it'll go through step one, which is the file type detection. And during file type detection, it basically goes in and says, 
each category plugin, which uh, determines what type of file you're dealing with, looks at it and says, All right, is this an executable? Yes, no. Uh, is this a PDF? Yes, no, and so on. And if it is an executable, then it uh, activates all of the executable plugins or executable analysis plugins. If it's a PDF, it, it, uh, <coughs> excuse me, it activates all of the PDF analysis plugins. So only those plugins uh, for the file types that were detected um, are activated. Um, I should say too that this isn't a um, uh, this isn't a one shot process. It's if Massive doesn't stop when it detects the first file type. Um, so if a file is simultaneously recognized as an executable and an office document, those two sets of plugins will be uh, analyzed. It's all done in parallel to each other. Um, so after file type detection is done, the uh, static analysis techniques are performed against the file. First thing it does is run generic analysis plugins, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and then for each of the types that were detected, each of the category plugins um, that detected uh, their file type, it runs the analysis plugins associated with that. <clears throat> so to drill down a little bit more into the category plugins, the category plugins have two purposes. Um, the first is to, their, their primary purpose is to determine the type of file that is being analyzed. Um, you want, this is the whole file type detection uh, component of the framework. Um, it's going to tell you, is it an executable, is it a uh, office document, is it a zip file, and so on. Uh, the secondary purpose of the category plugins is that it's going to group analysis plugins into file type categories. By grouping the analysis plugins into different type categories, then we're able to only uh, make sure that the, only those are executed when they're supposed to be executed. This allows us to get around the problem of having that master script which will run all the tools against all the files and potentially crash. Um, right now, the Category plugins which we have enabled or which we have released are for Windows executables, uh, PDF documents, uh, a generic Office OLE documents uh, detection, uh, zip archives, and then we have one called generic. And generic uh, plugins are basically the universal plugins that will run on any type of file. These are the, <clears throat> these are the ones that will generate like fuzzy hashes, that will pull out embedded strings, uh, that will submit it up or that will you know, check virus total to see if it exists on, fire, on virus total uh, and so on. So the way that the category plugins work within the, um, within the framework are, once you submit a file, the first thing Mastiff is going to do is go out and collect all the category plugins that you have installed. Like I said, these are plugins, so you can just add as many as you want. Um, once it collects that, it actually takes the file that you're analyzing, and it does run libmagic and trid against it. Uh, if you're not familiar with trid, uh, trid is another file type detection tool uh, created by, I'm going to get his name wrong, but I think it's uh, Marco Pantello. Um, and instead of using signatures like, uh, uh, like libmagic does, it uses patterns. So it'll actually scan the entire file, or most of the file, and it will t give you, the output will give you a percentage based on uh, what types of files that it thinks that it is. Um, so here I ran, I know, I apologize, it's kind of hard to see, um, but I ran a file using libmagic and then trid against uh, a Windows executable. And uh, the, at the very top, you can see that file detected uh, the executable as a P32 uh, executable, was, whereas TRID detected that there's a 51% chance that it's a Windows 64 uh, executable, a 31% chance that it's a uh, Win32 executable, and then a couple others below that. So Massive takes this data, it runs the, uh, uh, these um, uh, programs against it, uh, and then uh, grabs the output. Um, I should say that uh, since it's written in Python, um, Massive actually uses the libmagic uh, Python extensions to run that against it, but TRID doesn't have any um, uh, extension, Python extensions for it or an API for it, so we actually just kind of wrap the uh, TRID output. But once it gets that, um, for each category plugin that it detected, it calls a function called isMyFileType, and it submits the uh, information that it got from libmagic and TRID to it. Um, on the right-hand side is, is kind of the, um, the way that it does it, it it's uh, just a little loop. It goes through each category that it found, and it sends a dictionary that contains the magic and the, uh, the trid information for it, um, as well as the file name. So what happens at that point is, when is my file type gets this information, it goes through the libmagic and the trid output, see if it recognizes any of those as it be belonging to its file type, and then it also does some custom checks. Um, the reason that we just don't check the libmagic and the trib, trid output and go a bit further and do our own custom checks is that, 
like I said at the beginning, you know, file can miss things, TRID can misidentify things, and um, if a file is corrupted or has been obfuscated um, by the attacker, then we may need to do our own extra checks to, to, to do that. Um, so for example, the, um, uh, the Windows executable category plugin will go through, it will um, look for the MZ header and then it will jump so many bytes uh, to see if the PE header is there at various places within the file um, as well as looking at the output. Um, if it finds, if the category plugin does find that uh, the, the file is of the type that it detects, it returns its name to the master's plug, plugin, none otherwise. So this is our indication of whether or not the, uh, the file is of the category that we're looking at. Um, the category plugins are implemented as, um, um, sorry, the, the category plugins are implemented as Python classes. Um, so they're all derived from a base class called mastiff.category.mastiffplugin, which is really just a Yapsi, uh, uh, der or derived from a Yapsi uh, plugin class. Um, the, the nice thing about doing it in, in this way where we have it as Python classes is that we can actually derive additional classes from other uh, category classes. So in this particular case, we have the off, in the middle uh, row, we have the Office, EXE, Generic, ZIP, and PDF category classes. But uh, for Office, we could uh, further define additional category classes derived from the Office class for Word and Excel. Uh, what this allows us to do is, you know, if we detect that it's an Office document, uh, then we can do uh, further research to see is this a uh, Word document or is this an Excel document. We can even do things such as um, if we don't detect it's an Office document, but we do detect that it's a Word document because they're all going to have their own individual checks to determine, you know, whether or not it's, you know, part of the, uh, that class. You know, why is that? That, that becomes interesting for us. Um, on the zip side, you know, we have the uh, uh, zip category class, but then we can also have the, the Java, uh, I'm sorry, the JAR, the Office X, and the AP, the K category class to further define and uh, and make those uh, more detailed. Uh, the ones at top that I have the asterisk next to, those haven't been implemented in the current release. Uh, they'll probably be implemented in the next release or shortly. So that's category plugins. Um, analysis plugins, this is the code that implements the static analysis techniques themselves. Um, these are all associated with a specific file type and they will only run if that file type is detected. Um, Right now, uh, analysis plugins handle their own output. Uh, typically, it's to either a text file or a database. I should say that this is all command line. Um, there's no GUI interface, there's no HTML interface into this uh, at this point in time. Um, but analysis plugins uh, typically fall into two types. Um, one where the technique, the static analysis technique, is implemented within the Python code itself, um, or one where it actually calls a third party program uh, to perform analysis. Um, the goal of the uh, analysis plugin, well, there are really two goals of the analysis plugins um, log logistically. Uh, the first is each analysis plugin does one thing and does it really well. Um, we, when we created the analysis plugins, we really tried to make it so that one analysis plugin wasn't doing multiple things. We wanted it to be very good at what it did. Um, the second thing is we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, there are a lot of great libraries and tools already out there that which perform static analysis. Um, it doesn't make sense for us to go and try to rewrite those or re-implement those. Um, and that's why uh, many of the, um, or a lot of the analysis plugins will actually wrap a third-party program uh, and just take the output from it and put it to wherever we want it to go. <clears throat> so the architecture for the, uh, the way that the analysis plugins work, um, again, they're implemented as Python classes, which are derived from the, the category class. And so uh, what we're showing here is that for the generic category class, we have two analysis plugins um, that were derived from it, uh, embedded strings and fuzzy hashing. Uh, so when the generic uh, category class is uh, activated, which is really for any file, then these two analysis plugins will get, um, will get run. Uh, for, the office, uh, for the office category class, we have one called office metadata. And so that will only get run if the office ca category class has been activated. And then for the uh, Windows executable one uh, category class, we have the P header analysis and the resources uh, analysis uh, plugin, which will only get run, again, if the uh, Windows executable category class is activated. Um, so let's say we submit uh, a file called malware.exe to Mastiff. Uh, during the first step, uh, Mastiff, Mastiff is going to perform file type detection. And in looking at that, it sees that it's a Windows executable. And it also, uh, so it activates the Windows executable uh, category class, and it also activates the generic category class, because again, that gets run on everything. Um, it goes, 
after step one file detection is done, oh, you'll notice too that um, the office uh, uh, category class actually gets deactivated. So we know at the end of step one which, fi which file types were activated and which ones were, were deactivated. Um, then it moves to step two to perform the file type and, uh, to perform the static analysis techniques against that file. And only those um, analysis plugins which were run, or I'm sorry, which were activated, uh, are the ones that get run. So in this case, the embedded strings, fuzzy hashing, resources, and PE header analysis are the only ones that actually get run. The office metadata plugin does not get run because its category class was not activated. Um, currently, we have 16 uh, different analysis plugins available. Um, we have one which just performs general file type information, gets the name, the size, things like that, and stores it in a database for us. We have one that does fuzzy hashing, where it'll generate the fuzzy hash of the file. It'll actually store that fuzzy hash in a database, and then compare it to every other file that it has a fuzzy hash for. So you can very quickly see, have I looked at any files which are similar to this? Uh, one that pulls out the ASCII and Unicode embedded strings of a file. Uh, one that uh, run, checks the file hash against VirusTotal for you to see if VirusTotal has seen this before. And then run, one that will run YAR signatures uh, against the file. Um, I once heard somebody say that, you, uh, that a malware analysis tool cannot be considered a malware analysis tool until it can actually implement uh, and use YAR signatures. So that's why we have it. We can now use YAR signatures. Um, for Windows executables, we have one that pulls out the PE header information and it tells you the imports, uh, compile, ti compile time information, and so on. One that will uh, obtain the information on any resources within the file and actually extract those resources for you. We have one that will extract any uh, digital signatures uh, on the executable. And finally, one that will pull out single byte strings. Uh, for PDFs, we have uh, two plugins that will run uh, DDA Stevens. Uh, PDF ID and PDF parser tools against it and give you the output, and then one that will extract the uh, metadata from the document. For the office, uh, we have one that uh, extracts the office metadata from the documents, and one that runs uh, EvilCry's uh, PyOLE scanner on the document to find any embedded executables, any uh, known exploits, things like that. And finally, for the zip files, we have one that extracts the zip metadata and document information, and finally, one that actually extracts the zip archive contents. Um, Not yet. That's uh, something that I want to implement where th there's some type of queue mechanism within Mastiff uh, so that when um, you do extract something from a, a zip file, it automatically gets fed back in and the analysis process happens on that. I want, that's also useful too for um, PDF documents because when you un uncompress a PDF document, you want to send it back through to see what it does. Uh, there's an, Right. Right, and that that kind of gets something gets into something that I want to implement in the future as well. You know, right now we have two types of plugins. We have um, uh, analysis plugins and category plugins. I want to also implement output plugins so that the when. So instead of just having the analysis plugins just dump it to a file or a database, it sends it back to Mastiff, and then we have all these output plugins, which will either you know, send it to HTML or a text file or a database, or even do additional things like that, where it actually submits it up to you know, another tool or, or another site or something along those lines. Um, running Mastiff is actually pretty easy. Uh, there's a, a, a control script called mass.py. Um, you just run mass.py with the uh, um, with the file you want to analyze, and it'll go through. Oh, we've got a number of options, which I'm not going to go into, um, but suffice to say that a lot of the options will actually um, give you a lot of control over what you can do with uh, Mastiff and how it runs. Um, <coughs> excuse me. There is a uh, configuration file uh, that Mastiff uses. This is a Windows INI formatted config file um, that sets a lot of the options. Uh, typically, the options that are set within there are basically where to find the plugins, um, where to uh, dump your data to, uh, and then uh, any uh, options that the specific um, plugins actually need. Um, it, so typically what will happen with the way that I've been running it is uh, you have a master configuration file, and then there's actually a command line option which allows you to overwrite any of those um, uh, configuration options. Um, this is useful, especially when you get into something like um, zip extraction, where the zip file has a password on it. Um, you can set a pa there is an option to set uh, a password to uh, extract the, the files using that password, um, but you don't want to set that for everything. Um, so you can overwrite that with the command line option when you do come across something like that. 
Um, so I'll just jump into the demo. Are there any questions before I, I jump into to demoing it? No? Cool. All right. So let me, hopefully everybody can see that. Let me, this is going to be fun. Okay. So, so I have Mastiff installed on my uh, system. I'll just do, I can't really see what I'm doing here. So just to show you the uh, Mastiff configuration file, um, there are some default places that Mastiff will look for the configuration file. Um, the where I have it just happens to not be at where one of those are. Where's my mouse? So you can see that there's a lot of different options that um, Mastiff has. And I screwed that up. But, okay. So I've got a number of different files here. Um, geez, I can't type. There we go. All right, so I've got a number of different files here. Uh, the first one that I want to look at is Corkamix. This is the one that is uh, multiple file types. Um, if we do a uh, look at the bytes of the file, oops, sorry. Um, this is just using hex dump to dump it out. You can see that, you know, in the beginning there's a signature for the Windows executable, the MZ. Um, there's some printf for, um, for Python. There's the percent PDF, which uh, delimits the uh, beginning of the uh, PDF file, um, as well as some other things within there. Um, if, if we run file against it, it identifies it as a Windows executable. Obviously, it's not just a Windows executable. There's a PDF in there, there's an HTML file in there, and so on. Um, if I run trid against it, I can never remember the option. What did I miss up? So, Trid tells us that it's 100% sure that it's a, DOS a generic DOS executable. Um, again, obviously we know that it's not this. So if we had some master script, which was just using uh, file and trid to determine what type of file this is, we'd be missing stuff. We wouldn't see the information associated with the zip file that's within it. We wouldn't see information that's associated with the PDF that's within it and so on. So what I'll do is I'll run Mastiff against it. So what I'm going to specify, I'm going to give it, uh, the dash C option, which gives it the, um, tells it where the configuration file is. I miss that. You know, it's very hard to type and look at this angle. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to run it. It's going to go through really fast. And you are actually, will see some error messages because Corkamix does, um, it implements basically the base file type for that type of file. So like the zip file, it's not going to be able to extract uh, things out of it. Um, be, and that's really, I think, more a uh, problem with the Python zip library than anything else, because unzip will actually uh, grab them out. But you will see some errors, but they're, they're normal. So it runs through, goes through very fast. Let me pull this up so everybody can see it. So the first thing you should see is that it detected the file type as all of these. So it detected it as not only an, a Windows executable, but as a zip file, because it's a Java jar as well, and jars are based off of zips. And a, and a PDF, and as well as generic. Again, generic gets run on everything. Um, then it goes through, it gives you a lot of informational messages uh, based on um, you know, the different plugins that are running. Uh, here are our error messages. Um, again, this is, for some reason, the uh, Python zip library, it can't extract what it considers a corrupted zip file. If anybody knows a way around that, let me know, because I haven't been able to find anything in the API or the documentation for that on how to get around that. Um, so it's not able to actually extract those, um, but everything else it's able to get. There should be one other error message in here that I'm just not seeing from the virus total one, um, and the reason that is is because, yeah, down here, um, the reason that is because I'm not hooked up to the network right now and I don't have an API key listed in there. You do need an API key from virus total in order to, to submit things to them. Um, but so it went through, it grabbed all this information, it put it in this directory, so let's Go in there, and it basically dumps everything out into a bunch of different files. Um, the mastiff.log file uh, 
gets run for or gets created for every single file. This is basically just the all of the output that we just saw. It gets echoed into this file, and then there's actually also a master massive.log file for everything that gets analyzed. Um, we have our uh, massive-run.config. Uh, this is useful in case you modify any configuration options. It, this is the actual config that gets run, as well as uh, some other uh, information uh, associated with that. Uh, and then we have all of our different um, uh, pieces of information from the different um, uh, plugins that ran. So let me just pull up. So P info. Uh, there we go. So P info dash quick basically just analyzes the P header and just pull out some information which most analysts look for first. Um, in this particular case, we can see that it was detected as a Windows subsystem command line uh, file. And it actually, at the bottom, it may be hard to see for some people, uh, it actually did parse out one API. It found that it was using printf. So it did pull out some information for, for us. Uh, if we look at the zip info one, it went through and it, it parsed the, uh, the metadata from the, the actual uh, zip uh, characteristics to tell us everything about it. You know, it found three files in there, wasn't able to extract them because we saw those errors, um, but we can see that there was no compression. Uh, the, the modification dates, I believe, are all zeros. That's just because of the way the file is and so on. Um, so, you know, this is great for a, a test file like Corkamix, which is a bunch of different files, but, you know, how does it work against actual real files? So, let me... So I've got a bunch of different files here. Um, let me run it against bad.exe. If you can't tell, that's malware. Again, I need to specify the configuration file. And then I'll run bad.exe. So in this particular case, it only detected it as a Windows executable. It didn't detect any additional files that were within it. Um, but then it ran all the different um, the executable plugins against it. And then if we go into there, we have all the output that we can look at. Um, so let's look at pinfo quick. Um, we can see a bunch of different information on the file. It's a uh, command line tool. I think that's what it says. Um, it was created on September 20th. I think it says 2010. Um, we have some, uh, pars we don't have any partial warnings, but we have some file information we can look at. Then if we go down farther, we have all the imports that we can look at. And as analysts, you know, looking at this, um, this tells us a lot of information as to what the file can do uh, and, and things that will give us hints as to what it, uh, what the, um, uh, what it may do during dynamic analysis. Um, it didn't pull out any signatures because we don't see any signature files, but the resources file, we see that there is one resource uh, on the file. Um, we don't have a date for it, but it, the language associated with it is Chinese. Um, so I'm, you know, you can take that to be, you know, maybe this was Chinese in origin, maybe not, but this still gives you a clue as to where it came from. Uh, in fact, it actually pulled it out for you. So a lot of times malware will have uh, a resource as a file, um, or have a file, or another executable as a resource. This would actually pull it out for you, so then you can then go through. This is another reason why I want to implement the queue session, or the queue capability, so that any resources that it pulls out, it can just start analyzing again for you. Uh, and then, you know, we have the strings. It pulls out all the embedded strings for you. Um, and one of the cool things, I think, is that it pulls out single strings. Um, if you don't know what a single byte string is, um, it's essentially where a, um, uh, an attacker, to, to try to obfuscate strings, it'll do, you know, like string sub zero equals A, string sub one equals B. So when it's compiled, you don't have the, uh, the bytes um, uh, consecutively within the, uh, the program. You have some op code, some, you know, machine code, and then A, some machine code, and then B. Um, this will actually go through, find those machine codes for you, and actually pull out the string and, and recreate it for you. So. And then, I'll just run one more really fast. Uh, let's do the PDF. So it detected it as a PDF. Um, I don't see any error messages other than the virus total one, which uh, is, like I said, is because it doesn't have a uh, API within it. Or API key, I mean. 
And here we've got a bunch of uh, the information. We saw a lot of the information uh, from the um, uh, from the uh, the generic uh, plugins, uh, where it's pulled out the strings. Um, we have the fuzzy hashes up on top. For the fuzzy hash, it actually um, pulls out the fuzzy hash for you, and then it checks the database for any other fuzzy hashes. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. For the Yara check, we're just checking signatures. So, so the way it works is you basically give it a directory where all of your Yara signatures are at. Um, that would be an interesting output plugin to create where it automatically generates the Yara signature for you. Uh, but no, it doesn't do that right now. Um, and then uh, we have the output from PDF ID. Um, the interesting thing about the PDF parser one is first it uncompresses the PDF for you, so you have the uncompressed PDF there. But then any um, PDF objects that it finds which um, it has a basically like a blacklist of files that it wants to look at. Um, oh, I'm sorry, a blacklist of object types that it wants to pull out. It'll pull those out for you. So anything related to open actions or JavaScript, it'll automatically pull those objects out for you so you can look at it. So just looking at this really fast, we can see that object 13, I think that's 13. What am I typing wrong? Oh, that's right. Thank you. We can see that you know, it was a very large file. We have our JavaScript, which was embedded within the, uh, within the PDF itself. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I lost my place. Cool. So, uh, there's a question. No, it doesn't do any elf header yet. Um, in order to do that, all we would have to do is uh, create a file type uh, plug or a category plugin for, for elf files, which would be really easy to do, uh, and then just create the analysis plugins for it. Um, that's actually something that I've been looking at doing as well. It's just, most malware comes in on the Windows side, and so uh, that's where the, uh, the more, I guess, important ones are at the moment. It doesn't do any Packer detection uh, right now. Um, if you wanted to do that, you would have to implement it as, as a Yara signature. And quite frankly, I think it would be better to do it as a Yara signature um, to detect Packers that way. Um, again, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. Yara is really good at detecting things like that. So, yes? Any plan to uh, rebuild the IAT? I haven't had any plans for that yet. Um, but again, the reason I chose to do this in Python is because there are a lot of really great reverse engineering uh, libraries uh, in Python. And so I think it would be pretty easy to, to implement, uh, at least something uh, to begin to do that. Right. Right, exactly. So that's another reason why I really want to implement output plugins, because you can do so much just to, to have that whole feedback loop going back into it and doing things over and over again. Um, you know, I wanted to make uh, sure that um, plug or that Mastiff was, uh, it was easy to implement plugins within Mastiff. Um, and so in order to do that, um, I created a, a bunch of templates that are available to everybody when you download the, uh, the project. Uh, I actually call these skeletons, and there, there are three different types of skeletons that are available. There's one for category plugins uh, and two for analysis plugins. The two for analysis plugins basically are for the, uh, the types of uh, analysis where, you, where you're implementing the actual Python code to perform the analysis technique, and then there's one where you're just wrapping around a, another program to do it. Um, the nice thing about the, uh, at least that I think about the skeleton plugins, is that you can just load them up into any whatever VI, uh, you know, whatever IDE that you use, modify a couple values, and you have your uh, plugin ready to go. It's all, it's all ready to go. Um, uh, and all you have to do is copy it into the right directory, and uh, Massif should run it. Uh, in addition to that, we created a number of different APIs within the framework to make some tasks easier. So reading the configuration file, setting configuration options, uh, accessing the database, and so on. There's the wrapper API functions for you to, to do that. So if you don't know how to uh, program in Python or, or, you're, you're just, uh, or you're just learning, you don't have to worry about all the, the low-end stuff and in interacting with the framework. There's something already available for you. Um, one of the nice things about DARPA, uh, CFT, is that it forces you to make really good documentation. 
Uh, and so we have all the coding standards and information on how to uh, create these plugins uh, documented within the, uh, in a really big document uh, within, the, uh, within the, uh, the framework itself where you can down, when you download the framework you get this, that tells you how, how to do it all. Um, <clears throat> so future enhancements, um, I obviously want to make more category plugins and more analysis plugins because that's really the, uh, the whole, the, the beef of the project. This is what, you know, makes it what it is. Um, so coming down the line is our, uh, I want to make uh, basically stuff off of the zip file, so doing APK, JAR, and OfficeX analysis, uh, more analysis plugins. Like I talked about, I want to create, implement the output plugins um, as well as the queue implementation. Um, right now, uh, it only runs on Linux for sure. Um, I have not tested it on Windows and OS X yet. Um, I have a feeling that it probably won't run on Windows or, or, or OS X without a couple tweaks, but getting the, uh, getting the project compatible to run on those operating systems to make it more useful as well as one of the next steps. So the big thing is um, Mastiff was made to be extended. That's why we have the plugins, so that additional file types can be supported and additional techniques can be created. Um, so we want, we really want the community to get involved and basically crowdsource, you know, all the different techniques that you're using to make it more useful to you. Um, so if you have any, uh, uh, if you create any uh, plugins for this, whether it be a category or analysis plugin, send them to us and we'll implement it within the framework. Or at least we'll set up some place where you can upload them to uh, in order to, so that other people can um, download it. Uh, if you look at other uh, uh, projects which uh, work along the same uh, way, like Volatility or Metasploit, where they have you know, a way for a community submission. They're very popular and they, they, they do a lot of good. I mean, they're very useful. And that's what I'm trying to make with uh, Mastiff. If you can't code, that's fine. Just send me your idea and I'll code it up for you. Because I'm sure there are lots of different things that I'm not thinking of that um, could be implemented. Um, the, uh, the SourceForge URL is there, and we have an email address, massive-project at corelogic.com. You know, feel free to send us emails or uh, upload file or, not, or uh, post it to the discussion boards on uh, there. So, uh, thank you. Uh, questions? Uh, so not right now it doesn't. The question was, does it do uh, for the office any uh, post-2007 uh, XML format identification? Not right now. It would actually probably detect those as a zip file um, as opposed to anything else. The office uh, identification that we have right now is really for, you know, pre-2007, the OLE type formats. Um, so the question was, you know, what other, I, if I'm understanding it right, the question was what other techniques could you use to identify behavior through static analysis other than like looking at the import or, or putting it into IDA? Um, you know, embedded strings analysis would do it. Um, uh, those, that's the only one that's coming off the top of my head. Um, I, I'm sure there are. Uh, you know, there are lots of different things that can additionally be done. So. Um, a lot of uh, malware now is obfuscating the strings using XOR or something like that. Um, I'd love to implement something which does that, and that could reveal more behavior for you. Um, it would be pretty trivial, I think, to uh, write some um, uh, Python plugins using uh, DieStorm to uh, look for additional functionality uh, for other things that it's doing. Um, but right now, that, that's all that's implemented within Massive. Uh, any other? Yeah, in the back. The string analysis that it does right now is it just, it's just showing all the strings, all the ASCII and Unicode strings. Um, it doesn't do any intelligent um, strings analysis to find like URLs or um, uh, domains. There's a great tool out there, a Windows tool that does it, which I, I'm sorry, I can't remember off the top of my head what its name is, that does intelligent strings analysis, but it's closed source. Um, and it's Windows, so I, I couldn't, I, I haven't been able to implement it within here, but I'd like to do something similar to that so that, you know, you give it some regular expressions and you do find things uh, uh, where it does do a more intelligent strings analysis than, than what it does right now. Anyone else? All right, well, thank you very much.